There we go. Okay. Well, welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, my name's Nancy Howell. I am on the board of Western Cuyahoga Audubon, and I want to introduce Drina Nemes, uh, our book discussion coordinator and book selector. Oh my, uh, so many books, so little time, as they say. <laughs> yeah. uh, but Drina does a fabulous job of selecting a, just a nice variety of books not just on birds, but nature and many, many other things too. So uh, without any further uh, discussion, I am going to uh, hand it over to Drina and uh, she will share her screen and hopefully we'll get, get a good discussion going. Okay, I am sharing my screen and getting started from the beginning. Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to our Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society Book Club. And this is the third session for this season. And we are just ending our fourth year of book clubs discussions. And tonight we'll be talking about Finding the Mother Tree, Discovering the Wisdom of the Forest by Suzanne Samard. If you haven't read the book, it's A-OK, -okay, and I hope that you will enjoy the discussion and perhaps you will want to read the book in the future. Well, our author, Suzanne Samard, professor of forest ecology at the University of British Columbia, and uh, her book, Finding the Mother Tree, has become a bestseller. Uh, it was published in uh, 2021. Uh, this is from the introduction. What started as a legacy, then place of childhood home, solace and adventure in Western Canada has grown into a fuller understanding of the forest and further an exploration of how we can regain our respect for this wisdom and heal our relationship with nature. Um, the structure of the book, it's set up with an introduction 15 chapters that have some very intriguing titles. Uh, there's an epilogue, acknowledgments, and then there's a quite an extensive bibliography. And we learn how much research Suzanne herself has done, how much research she has also uh, read and absorbed. And also, I feel like she is such a promoter of other people's research. She's such a collaborator. And the book is... Uh, not only about trees, but it's also a memoir. So we learn a lot about Suzanne uh, uh, over the course of the book. One thing we know for sure is that she is certainly steeped in British Columbia. And I thought I might show just, uh, just to acquaint ourselves with some geography of uh, British Columbia. And um, she was born in the South western and south, cent south central area of British Columbia. Um, she spends time in Kamloops. She spends time in Lillooet in one of her first jobs. Uh, she does a lot of her research uh, for her PhD in this area. Her dearly beloved brother, um, Kelly, lives in Williams Lake. She, um, I believe she lives in Nelson right now. She lived there uh, when she was married with her husband and her two children, and a lot of her family is from this area. But a good part of her professional life has been here in Vancouver. And um, then we can't see it here, but we also know that she spent time southeast, way down south at uh, Corvallis, Oregon, at the um, Oregon State University. She also did uh, some research, and we find it in the last chapter uh, it, near Bella Bella. And this is where she does a lot of work with looking at how salmon and the nitrogen from salmon is ending up in, in trees. The nitrogen gets passed on into the trees. Well, um, just a little uh, facts about British Columbia size compared to Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, it's such a difference. Um, the area is so much bigger. Uh, Ohio is about 12% the size of British Columbia. And uh, for those of you who are interested in some trivia, 
um, British Columbia is bigger than Texas, but not Alaska. Now the population of all of British Columbia, even though it's so much bigger, is 5,610,000. And that's about half of what Ohio is these days. And then the population density, um, British Columbia, there are 14 persons per square mile. Whereas in Ohio, it's 282 people per square mile. So British Columbia has so much space compared to us. I just wanna tell my California friends that Ohio is just above California in terms of density. So Ohio is 10th in the nation <laughs> for population density and California is 11th. I was very surprised at that because California's population is, is so large. Um, I also wanted to uh, introduce us to the various forests of British Columbia, which are of such interest and uh, to Suzanne over her whole life. And in the area here where she spent a good part of her childhood and growing up, um, the areas that we see are Engelman spruce, Ponderosa pine, and then interior Douglas fir. Um, and then over in uh, Vancouver, we see the coastal uh, western hemlock. And uh, so there's a variety here, um, 14 different forest types um, in British Columbia. So she says, I was born to the wild and I come from the wild. And uh, of course, forests is, are her just passion. And um, here's an example of an old growth tree. And it might be one of those trees, the mother tree, that is a uh, old tree. It contains uh, so much uh, carbon that it is able to send it out through the fungus to other trees, to saplings and help them come along. Um, here's some mountains and we learn along the way that she is um, an avid skier, hiker. Uh, she loves the outdoors. Throughout the book, she has various encounters with grizzly bears and other bears, and uh, they form part of the, this her memoir. And then um, her brother Kelly uh, was a uh, true true blue cowboy, and she uh, takes in the cowboy world herself. She's very familiar with it and enjoys going to rodeos and watching her brother in rodeos. So. One of her first, very first jobs, uh, she's about 20 years old, and she's working for a commercial logging company in between um, college and during the summer. And uh, she is asked to count seedlings, to check out seedlings and see how they're doing in a clear cut area. So does this look drastic to you? What's happened in terms of just tearing down, cutting down everything? Well, that's the um, environment that she was working in because so much clear cutting was going on. And she so mourns what's happening. And uh, as of today, only 3% of the old growth forest is left in British Columbia. They went through a period of just drastic uh, clear cutting. And uh, it pains her deeply to see that. And then just to show a little bit to scale how big some of these trees are that have been cut down and clear cut. So in this very first job that she has, the clear cut area, it had been subalpine fir. And she's going through um, the, this type of forest as she's getting to the clear cut area. And uh, when she gets to the clear cut area, and looks at the seedlings, she's uh, just rather astounded. The seedlings do not look well. Most of them look sickly with yellow needles. And um, she's trying to figure out like what happened. And she does dig up a few of the seedlings and she notices that they are, they have been planted according to a very specific strategy so the method of planting was followed, but the roots have not grown at all. They're compact and they're actually black. So something's happened that the roots have not been able to take hold in the soil. 
Well, while she's there, she happens upon a, a subalpine fir a uh, little seedling. Apparently it had grown from a seed in the area itself. And she, uh, it, it's so healthy, it looks great. And she uh, attempts to pull it out, but the roots are so deep, she has to work at it. She does manage to pull this seedling out and she finds that the roots are extensive and look quite healthy. But additionally, all the roots are covered with a fungus. And she's kind of wondering, a fungus, what's going on here? And that's kind of uh, one of her beginning notions about uh, paying attention to what's going on in the soil. So um, the reason, one of the reasons that this clear cut policy was put into place because there was another policy called Free to Grow, adopted by the Forest Service. And Free to Grow was based upon this uh, kind of Darwinian idea of survival of the fittest. That if you had, if you prepared an area that was free of all competition, then the planted seedling, the planted tree, whatever you were planning, planning to grow, it wouldn't have any competition. And theoretically, it would do absolutely great. It would grow the fastest and uh, you could plant what you wanted and you could be as efficient as possible. Well, in order to remove all of the competition, it would require uh, tremendous amounts of work, which were expensive. So this was not an easy undertaking in terms of financially. And the clear cutting could be done chemically with herbicides, which is expensive and also uh, dangerous in many ways, and then, or physically. Um, and I came across this, uh, this uh, John Deere uh, gigantic tractor. Um, it's called a Buncher Feller, and it has a mechanical arm on it that can encircle a tree. It also has a saw on it, so it can saw the log. And so it's uh, such a huge machine. And imagine what that tractor-like machine would do just going across the environment, crushing things, um, just, you know, flattening everything that it, it, it crawls over. So they use these type of, uh, this type of machinery um, to clear cut an area as efficiently as possible. Um, so along with this free to grow then, um, additionally, part of the efficiency would be to choose um, a species of tree then, which would be uh, commercially valuable and perhaps grow the fastest. So they did not necessarily plant trees that were uh, uh, accustomed to that area or native. A lot of lodgepole pines were planted. So this mystery continues for uh, Suzanne. Why didn't the seed, seedlings connect with the soil? And actually this question becomes her quest. Early on in her childhood, she recounts an episode where uh, her the family dog had fallen into the outhouse and uh, it was rather deep, but the men of her family, her uncles and her grandfather and her father uh, have to have to chop through this old growth forest area through the roots to get to the area where the dog is. And it takes them a long time. It takes them hours to do it. But this is her first uh, experience really seeing the underground and the root system and also fungus. And she sees many strands of fungus. And that is also somewhat of her awakening to this idea of the underground. And so her, one of her questions is, well, what do fungi have to do with trees? And in this chapter where she's talking about finding these sickly looking seedlings in the clear cut area, she does talk a little bit about mushrooms and talks about the mycena and the sulis mush, 
uh, mushrooms that she finds along the way. She finds them in this area. And uh, she gives us an introduction to some information about both of these species. And the Mycena um, is one of those fungi that, uh, that um, is saprophytic, meaning that it feeds on dead things and cleans up, uh, cleans up a forest. And the Sulis is a, a friendly fungus and it's associated with pines and it becomes one of those um, symbiotic fun fungi that we'll talk about it a little bit more. Um, me, I knew like nothing much about fungi at all, except for mushrooms that I eat and see in the stores. And uh, I had even forgotten that there's a whole kingdom uh, called fungi. Um, but so I had to do a little work um, besides what Suzanne shares in her book. So um, I learned a little bit about like the mycelium, which is the, the root-like structure of a fungus. And it's a mass of thread-like strands known as hyphae. And they grow like crazy. They are very, um, very fast growing. So it's through this uh, mycelium that a fungus absorbs different materials and it absorbs different nutrients and water. And it does it in a couple stages. The hyphae are able to secrete enzymes, which can help break down um, the different sources that they're um, interacting with. And then um, they are absorbed into the mycelium. And this graphic uh, shows this um, phenomenon known as mycorrhiza. Uh, mycorrhiza is, comes from the roots of mykes and rhiza, meaning fungus and roots. So it's like fungus and root together. And that's the symbiotic relationship between um, the plant or tree and the fungus. Um, so we see in this graphic how leaves um, photosynthesize and they, in their photosynthesis, they bring that those materials, those sugars down and the fungus is able to use those for itself because it's not able to make um, this kind of material. Meanwhile, uh, at the same time then, the mycelium is pulling up nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen, as well as water and delivering it to the roots of the tree. And so it's um, symbiotic, both of them benefit. Um, I was, um, looking through the bibliography, I found like, here's a whole journal devoted to mycorrhiza. There's another journal called Mycorrhiza Network. So there's a lot of research and Suzanne contributes a lot to that. Well, um, a little bit more of the mystery about the effects of fungus and also the role of different trees and shrubs in this area comes out in the chapter, Alder Swales. This was a rather, um, I found it a very fascinating uh, chapter too, in that uh, she gets into some of the research, um, um, how research goes about and how in this chapter, she has um, about 20 prisoners. They've come from a prison to help work in this area and to help cut down the alder because they're going to clear cut it. And um, it's, it turns out to be kind of a dangerous situation because after two hours, the prisoners um, are getting antsy and they're starting to um, kind of rebel. And there really isn't, um, it's not a safe situation. So, and also they did a very poor job of what they were asked to do. And so it ends up that she and her sister um, end up doing the job that they needed to do that they had hoped the other guys would be doing. So um, with alders, um, this is a, a species that's not common to us on, on the East Coast. Uh, it's more of a Western species. And uh, it is shown here, it's more like a shrub and it grows like crazy. 
um, especially grows like crazy after it's been, if it's been cut down and the sprouts are left and there's nothing else around it, um, it grows even bigger than it was before. So it was considered a weed. And um, what uh, Suzanne Samard did in looking at alders was that she wanted to see, well, what is the relationship between alders and pines? And so uh, in doing her study, she was able to set up different situations where there was, uh, the alder was completely killed. There was no alder at all. Then there were other areas where there were varying amounts of alder. And then she planted the pine seed seedlings around and looked to see what happened. And what she found out was that um, actually alders were helpful because they supplied a lot of nitrogen more than other uh, plants do. Um, alders are known to use a lot of water, but they also share it too because they have micro mycorrhiza networking and the mycorrhiza help the alder too with water. So pine seedlings actually grow better with alders. So clear cutting them is would not really be that good of an idea. Um, without any alder in a completely bare land, um, there's no nitrogen um, after about a year because all the nitrogen that would have come from the alders that were uh, destroyed has already been used up within the soil. So the pine seedlings then became quite malnourished and then they succumbed to pine, mountain pine beetle. Um, and then Suzanne came back later and 30 years later, she found that there was only like 10% of the pine left after 30 years. So in the long term, when you're looking to plant um, forests for timber and so forth, over 30 years, that's not a very good return of only 10%. She went back later and she got a little bit more um, specific and learned that it's 35% it's less alder um, is 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 good, but if you have more than thirty five percent of alder, it does impede pine seedlings while they're saplings. After ten or fifteen years, it doesn't matter. But initially, too much alder does interfere if you're planting pine and you want a lot of pines. So this is her master's degree: competition among lodgepole pine seedlings and plant species in a Sitka alder dominated shrub community in the Southern interior of British Columbia. And that was, she had several studies that came out of that Alder study. Um, and I think this is 1990, her master's degree. Um, in 1997, she's done quite a bit by 1997. Her research has expanded quite a bit and she um, publishes an article um, called Net Transfer of Carbon Between Ectomide, Ectomycorrhizal Tree Species in the Field. She submits it to Nature Magazine, and it is, after she's made some revisions, accepted. And this is such an honor, a prestige to be published in Nature. And a lot of her male colleagues are not that, you know, not keen on her success, nor do they necessarily believe what she's been saying about fungus. So she's not really getting recognition that you think she would get. Um, and then um, this article becomes kind of the subject of controversy over a period of years. And her PhD um, director says, let's go back and do some more work on it. So they do, and then they come up with this amazing, more amazing research that shows not only that carbon transfers from birch to pine, but it also goes from pine to birch, it's bi-directional. And she's really the first researcher who has shown that it's bi-directional. And it appears that um, pines are gonna send carbon to birches when birches don't have any leaves, um, when they shed their leaves and they can't photosynthesize. This uh, article launches her career quite dramatically. And uh, she's kind of off in another, uh, to another level of research. 
Um, interestingly, Nature Magazine uh, gave a subtitle to her article and called it the Wood Wide Web. And that uh, really captured um, the imagination of this fungal network is like a natural internet. So um, in chapter nine, nine hour, chapter 12, excuse me, nine hour commute. Um, uh, this was like, I think one of my favorite chapters because uh, her enthusiasm for what she's doing and her love of the forest and her curiosity, it all comes out in this chapter. And she finds this Douglas fir um, area, it's old forest, and it's, she thinks it's just perfect for research. And this is where the wood wide web is actually going to be mapped. And uh, you can, her excitement is palpable. One of her students, uh, along with her, worked on this area, and they did find in the area uh, this fungus called, it's named Rhizopogon. And remarkably, it covered one half of all the Douglas firs in this given area. And they were astounded with that. But also there were 60 other species of fungus in the same plot. And what they did is they mapped this. And this map, um, the largest and darkest green dots represent the oldest and largest trees. And then you can see their green, uh, other green dots of varying size, and they are to represent the different ages. And the ages of the oldest trees in this plot are over 300 years old. Um, the very tiniest one, I'm not sure if you can see the yellow um, dots here, but those are saplings. They're um, between, they're about 10 years old. So they were excited about this because it was like such a, uh, it had such a diverse age group of trees. So this is how they mapped the strands of the fungus from tree to tree. And uh, they were somewhat astounded with what they found. And it did give her uh, the idea that these, the, the largest and the oldest trees had so many also connections. And she called these hubs. And then she went on to call them mother trees because they were in a way taking care of the younger trees. And that's partly how the term mother tree came to be. And then another student, a little bit later, had um, access to other tools. And he was able to, through DNA analysis, get very specific about this rhizopogon. It turns out there are two different kinds of rhizopogon fungus in this area. Uh, it's a huge area, 30 by 30 meters. Uh, there were 67 firs in the area. I'm not sure if you can see the black dots here, but each black dot represents where they took samples of the rhizopogon fungus and then mapped it. And um, there were 401 samples. So the DNA analysis uh, showed that there are just each individual strand of rhizopogon, it's, it's an individual, like we're individual people. So the DNA analysis is, is, was quite specific. Now the tree marked here with the arrow, it was um, it had the most connections and it had 47 different connections. And some of them were more than 20 meters away. It's the, rather astounding. And here's um, a couple graphics. Uh, this is one of the Rhizopogon um, it's called wine rhizopogon or rhizopogon vinicolor, kind of wine colored. And then the other rhizopogon was fasciculosis. And on here you can see the fungus is black strands around um, a seedling. So that's rhizopogon um, myco mycorrhiza. Um, let's see. This. Um, I'm not seeing the top of my screen because of some of the Zoom things, but this is, um, she's starting to put everything together in the last chapter, a kind of a review of her major research. So it's it, it's kind of nice that she pulls it together. 
And early on, she did work with birch and fir. And, um, you know, according to clear cut policy, birch is a weed. And so they wanted to get rid of birch. And she wanted to see, well, should we really get rid of birch? And uh, the experiment she did severed the mycorrhizal network. Um, and she used trenches aligned with plastic to try to keep the mycorrhizal um, separated from um, the new plantings. Um, and what she found was that with mycorrhiza for the untrenched trees, no trench at all, the birchers were two times taller. They were free, free of this armillaria fungus, which is uh, pathogenic and can kill trees if it has an opportunity to completely encircle a tree. The birches were in prime condition. Um, so her conclusion was too that firs do better with birches. A clear cutting does not really help and it's so expensive. And um, later, as we talked about, she shows this is bi-directional. Carbon transfers to birch and vice versa. And then another experiment um, looking at just Douglas firs by themselves. And this is up in this part of um, British Columbia. Um, without birch around Douglas firs, that armillaria has more of a chance to infect the Douglas firs. She also did experiments with high density, having Douglas firs very close together or further apart. But for the high density, meaning only one or two meters apart, the understory is so dark and the floor is bare. These um, firs were more susceptible to armillaria. And also you could see there weren't future generations emerging, there weren't saplings. If they were five meters apart, which um, is like about 16 feet, almost 16 feet, there is an opportunity for a lot more diversity because seeds not only from the firs, seeds could be brought in from a different firs in the area, but maybe of a, a little different genetic background from squirrels or birds or um, through the wind. So with five meters apart, there was a much richer area in varying ages of the tree. So was it healthier? But she looks back on this and she had made such a rigid experiment and she sees that after 21 years, boy, nature just <laughs> wasn't gonna let us stay the way she had made it so rigid. And actually new trees had moved in. She also found like she couldn't control things like moose eating the birches, which they like. So um, new word for me, herbivory, I didn't know that it meant animals eating plants. So she kind of jokes a little bit about how, um, you know, without uh, human beings and our scientific methods, nature takes over and rejuvenates itself. It heals itself and she finds that to be uh, very um, profound that nature heals itself. Again, in this chapter, Passing the One, she does so much research and with different people and she collaborates and she collaborates with a, I'm not sure if this woman was Chinese. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it either right, one one song. But um, this researcher had done other research and found that tomato plants communicate with each other. And tomato, tomato plants will tell each other if one of them is sick, if there's something wrong, it will send signals to others to warn them so that they can manufacture these uh, defensive enzymes to help protect them. So um, this researcher wants to work with Suzanne and see if this also applies to trees. Are they able to warn or tell their kin or other trees that something's happening? And uh, they do find that. They find that trees are able to tell um, their kin of the same um, lineage and also strangers, uh, stranger seedlings that something is going wrong. They do give, the mother trees give more carbon to their kin than to the strangers, but they still give them to both of them. So 
they're helping out the whole community. And then um, uh, another one of her students, Monica, confirms all of this um, research um, in another research experiment. Um, so for her, uh, then, as we read on and on in the book, her mystery is resolving as she has learned so much more about how the fungus works to uh, sustain trees and tree sustain fungus, and it's a symbiotic relationship. Um, some resources, there are so many. Um, there's, uh, she has more than one TED talk. Um, Terry Gross interviewed her on Fresh Air. That's an excellent interview. And then recently, I just, um, just a few days ago, I found this Mother Trees and the Social Forest, and it is just excellent. Um, and it has fantastic video videos um, re related to everything talked about in the book. And it shows also like her logging family uh, with videos and how they did their logging. And um, just, it, it's wonderful. Uh, and it's, um, I think it might be, I don't know if it's three years old, but uh, it's very, very good. So she also uh, talks about in her book how wise the forest is, and then it's wired for wisdom, sentience, and healing. Um, so this is the end of our, our session for this season. We read um, Litter in the Green, Vester Flights, and now Finding the Mother Tree. And the books for next season have yet to be selected. There are so many choices, it's really hard to make a choice. So I'd just like to open it up then and for, for discussion and questions and comments. Well, Darina, first of all, thank you so much. You did a bunch of research to learn about the mycelia and all that other, oh, the, 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 just the way things were working together. And just to kind of butt in, uh, years and years and years ago, I had read a book called The Secret Life of Plants. And, and it had some of this information, not, a, not about the mycorrhiza, but about the chemicals that one plant might give to another if they're getting chewed on by insects, it, kind of like a warning, as you mentioned. And I thought that was fascinating. So this really brought home a lot of other uh, discussion and thoughts and, um, you know, just planting a tree in your backyard. Does it have the mycorrhiza to survive and that type of thing? Um, so stick with native plants. How about that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, right. Again, if anyone wants to ask a question or, Drina, do you want to uh, ask anyone uh, anything in particular? Well, I, I would also just like to say this book has so much in it, and I didn't say anything at all about her connection to Indigenous wisdom and to Indigenous peoples, nor did I say much about her family or about her um, episode with breast cancer and um, her uh, professional life, we talked a little bit about that, but there's so much to the book and I, there's so much, I, I didn't know how to include everything. <laughs> I put in the chat that there is a super kids book called The Secret Life of Trees. Mm -hmm. And the, Absolutely. I think, the adult version is called Trees, and it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, uh, I'd like to share a few thoughts. Um, I read the book, and I was really excited about this book discussion. I want to thank you, too, Drina, for all the hard work you've done and all the thoughts you put into this and the science. And, you know, it's so fascinating to me because... I'm very outspoken about um, feminism and I saw so much of that in this book. And, um, you know, she really did have to go up against a very, very male dominated, you can imagine, you know, the forestry industry, the 
the felling industry of, of cutting trees. And, um, you know, it, she even came up, I don't know if you remember this, Drina, but she even came up against, um, and that's how I interpreted it, that chapter with her brother Kelly, when she went to see him and they kind of got into a bar fight, you know? Yes. And uh, he changed his demeanor and his attitude when he was around the other men foresters. And yeah. he didn't treat her like he usually treated her with respect and as his sister. And I thought that was really interesting. And she did get very angry about that. Um, I love how she paralleled the fungus and mycelium connections of the trees, you know, and the soils to our human synapses. She talks a lot about the parallels between trees and human beings. And I found myself at one point, it, it wasn't just anecdotal anymore for me. It was like, there really was no difference, you know, there really is no difference between um, the plant, the, the tree life, the plant life, the soils, and how the mother trees pass along um, the nutrients and the wisdom and the protection and the communications. And it's just mind blowing. And I, I'd heard of her before, and her research, and I, I'd heard tangentially a couple things about it, but it wasn't until I read the book that I was really able to see you know, how she, she spells out the emotional and cultural connections uh, between humans and between trees. I mean, trees can actually like have these connections that are cultural connections that help them to thrive and communicate just like we do. Um, it's just, they're just a different species. Um, and I also want to go back a little bit. I don't want to talk too long. I just want to say a couple more things. When, when I got to that chapter where she had to start driving nine hours and I noticed this happened again, okay? <laughs> it's the aspect of emotional labor and she put her career ahead of her marriage and her marriage fell apart. And men do that all the time and the marriage doesn't fall apart. So moving along, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and then she talks about... Um, this is the thing that drove, drives me crazy because I keep going back. Like you showed that picture with that monstrosity of a machine grasping onto the tree and just ripping it out by its roots. What could be more um, male thinking than that? What could be more, you know, just rip it out by its roots? And it's this delicate, ancient, irreplaceable, absolutely exquisite system and these men just come and rip it out you know mm -hmm. um and again i just i kept seeing these parallels between human nature and the forest and 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 the trees and you know i'll, I'll just give a shout I'll, I'll shut up here in a second but i'll give a shout out to what you said because she did admit and i'm glad you mentioned this that she wasn't the first one to realize mm -hmm. the wisdom of the forest and how it's all interconnected when she talks about the salmon Mm -hmm. um, and the salmon feeding the trees with nitrogen because the Native Americans knew that a long time ago. But she should be credited as the first one to put it into layperson's scientific terms, mm -hmm. a, a way that we can all understand. You know, I could say so much more. There's just so much more I want to say. But um, for me, as a feminist, I mean, that's what, that's the thing that stands out for me the most in the book is, um, all the things that she had to go through and experience and overcome. And she even admitted that she was not a very assertive person and she still managed to completely revolutionize the industry. Mm -hmm. I just wanna thank you again for having this discussion. Oh. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's such an excellent book. Has anyone else read the book or at least part of it or maybe listened to it on tape? Well, I read the book. Mm, yeah. mm -hmm. um, I really enjoyed it. And I think she made the science more engaging and more accessible because she wove it not just with, you know, she wasn't just dryly presenting the science, but, you know, you have her whole struggles and her background and uh, everything that's happening to keep you engaged with the whole story. Um, it's interesting, um, sort of, I mean, not, not to... Um, jump on too much with uh, some of the stuff um, Lucy said, but when, you know, 
I first early in the book and she's working with the foresters out of college and stuff like that. And she's, you know, getting the treatment and the attitude she's getting, which, you know, goes on all throughout the men. All I could think about you is I, I was an engineer for the first, you know, 20 some years of my career. And all I could think is, oh, all of us. <laughs> <laughs> So, but anyway, I did, I did enjoy the book and um, yeah, if you haven't read it yet, I would highly recommend it because the, of the way she weaves her story in and you care about her story as much as about the science you're getting. Yeah, I read the book when it first came out. So it's been a, it's been a while. And uh, the first thing that struck me about it was that here she comes from this forestry fam family and she's able to break out of that kind of thinking um cuz that you know that's it was several generations mm -hmm. of of foresters and uh, i actually have a soil science background so i was familiar with the mycorrhizae and uh but i loved the way she told the story and mm -hmm. um and went into such depth about her research and, and made it understandable to everybody that, you know, would be interested. I, um, I think I skipped a slide. Do you recall that there was a slide, um, about time magazine, um, having her as no. Okay. Well, there is a slide and, um, this is so exciting. Well, the first thing is that she was named as one of the 100 most influential persons for 2024. Okay. So that was such an honor. But also, I found out this weekend that the rights to her book were bought by Amy Adams and um, Jake Gyllenhaal. And Amy Adams is going to star as Susan Samard in a movie. So, right. <laughs> so I hope it's going to be in the near future. She did buy the rights in 2021 as soon as the book came out. So there's been a little bit of time already, uh, even with the writer's strike and so forth. But um, so I'm um, I'm hoping they'll do justice, you know, justice to the book and the story. Mm -hmm. Well, I know sometimes talk... that's what happens when when a when a book uh, is turned into a movie. It's like no, they didn't follow it very mm -hmm. well at all, you know. And but mm -hmm. um, you know, I I I don't know who those actors and directors may be, mm. but uh, hopefully they'll be Jake Gyllenhaal. I've heard of, but I'm not sure. Amy, what was her name? Amy, Amy Adams. 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 Okay, yeah, I'm not familiar with her at all. I just wanted to throw something out there about the chemicals. Um, and I know you mentioned this, Drina, the, about the chemicals that they were using to um, early on to do the experiments and she felt terrible about it. And I think she was yeah. with her sister or her friend to, and they had to do it in order to prove the, the outdated paradigm, paradigm of forestry as, um, you know, falling short but then she wound up getting cancer later, you know, and she right away thought about that. Um, you know, and she talks about, I, doesn't she come right out and say that it was glyphosate in there? Yes. You know, she which does. is what Roundup is. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That, that chapter is, is I think entitled killing soil and, uh, it is extremely painful for her to do that work as it is for her sister uh, who helps her. And um, yeah, such a, a sad state of affairs to be having to kill, kill living things. Really, again, I really appreciate all the work that Drina has put into the book discussions for this past year. And I think we can't wait until next year, next year's a series of books discussions. Oh, uh, Drina, remind us of what months those fall in. 
Um, we've been doing them um, in October, January, and April. Usually, uh, we try to aim for the third Tuesday. Yeah, so we do send out lots of information through either our newsletter or our e-newsletter. Uh, perhaps you look at our website at times uh, to find out, you know, some of the different things that we have going on as far as uh, uh, the book discussion for, for one and our, our uh, programs, our members programs and bird walks. I know folks from California probably wouldn't be able to make it very easily, <laughs> but um, you know. Oh, and by the way, this is going, this is being recorded. So this will be uh, put uh, on our YouTube channel so that you can uh, go back and listen to it again. Uh, so we really appreciate everyone who who joined us this evening. Yes, we do. Thank you. Thank you, Drina, for inviting us. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See you later. You. Bye. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.